At least six people have died in an outbreak of the new coronavirus, which has now reached the United States. Oh, thank you. I really wish that we could bring people into the hospitals and just for a few minutes show the kind of agony that we're seeing. This is a battlefield and we've turned ourselves from nurses into soldiers. We're the epicenter of the world and it's a, a direct result of the policy decisions that have been made. It's the things that I see in the ER are scary. I'm a little scared myself. I'm in the funeral business, but I am tired of hearing the word death. More than 200,000 Americans have died from COVID-19. Quite frankly, there's not an epidemic or pandemic that's justifiable. It is still taking hundreds of lives each day and we have it under control, it's uh, going to be just fine. And it didn't have to be this way. It's going to disappear. One day it's like a miracle, it will disappear. You can't say things like that when you're the president. This crisis is real, the virus is real, people are dying. COVID-19 is a health crisis without precedent in modern history, but it did not arrive without warning. Diseases know no boundaries, they threaten us all. The pandemic is a lot like a forest fire. We have to put in place an infrastructure that allows us to see it quickly, isolate it quickly, respond to it quickly. Through in-depth interviews with former U.S. officials across four administrations, we hear stories from those who knew this day would come and tried to prepare. One thing I learned is that anything you say about a pandemic before it happens comes out alarmist. Anything you've done after it happens, it turns out, seems inadequate. This is this has rocked America to its to its heels. It's rocked us pretty badly, and we're not out of it completely yet. It didn't have to be this way, and I think that kind of tragedy is the saddest tragedy of all. We must be able to recognize a biological attack quickly in order to stop its spread. We will work to upgrade our public health systems for detection and warning, to aid our preparedness against terrorism, and to help us cope with infectious diseases that arise in nature. Bill Clinton was a very interesting person. He was intellectual, he read a lot of things, and he read along the way a, a book called The Cobra Event, and The Cobra Event was about a biologically engineered uh, virus that caused a huge global pandemic. For President Bill Clinton, it was a piece of fiction and a real-life defector that set off the first alarms about the threat of a pandemic. In the previous five or six years, there was a defector from Russia who described a long-term Russian offensive bio attack program that they were building in Russia to potentially use against the United States. Why, for example, biological weapons could be considered one of the most dangerous weapons in the world. So he had access to that classified information and along with this uh, book that he uh, just read, became extremely interested in the whole idea of American preparedness in response to a biologic attack. One of the key areas, however, as many people spoke to me about the problem, was the fact that we were perhaps not as prepared with respect to biological terrorism. But it also hadn't been all that long before that there had been novel strains of flu and the swine flu affair and all of those sorts of things. And so we needed to think about how do we modernize our science? How do we modernize our preparedness? Because I think we all believed, and I think still do believe, that the role and responsibility of government is to prepare for the worst. Clinton worked with his top advisors on a biodefense bill to address the nation's vulnerabilities. It was also, I think, during the Clinton administration that people really started to worry in a, a more structured and serious way about pandemic preparedness and the way vaccines were made and our vulnerability. Creating stockpiles of medicines and vaccines to protect our civilian population against the kind of biological agents our adversaries are most likely 
to obtain or develop. The National Pharmaceutical Stockpile was created in 1999, a repository for vaccines and protective equipment, antiviral agents and antibiotics, ready to be sent to any part of the country within 12 hours. I think the creation of the National Stockpile is a really critical pivot point in our preparation. That, that is, I think that once we made the decision to do that, we made a decision as a country that this was a threat that we were aware of, it was a threat we were going to prepare for, and also was an acknowledgement that this was going to have to be handled on a national basis. Over the decades, the stockpile was used to respond to dozens of public health emergencies, to floods, hurricanes, and outbreaks of disease. Back in the 90s, people thought that health was completely separate from national security issues under most circumstances. The only people who dealt with it were people who are health professionals. What we discovered as we started worrying about biologic attacks is that health can also be a security issue and that security is coordinated in the U.S. government out of the National Security Council. For the first time, um, I think in our history, there is a senior commissioned public health officer in the National Security Council who works there, Dr. Ken Bernard. In 1998, Donna Shalala, Secretary of Health, sent me over to the National Security Council as the first person to do health policy. I opened a very small office, made a number of successful initiatives appreciated by the National Security Advisor and the President. So for the first time, we have a strong health presence in the National Security Council. The Bush administration came in. Governor, are you ready to take the oath? I am, sir. Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. They abolished I, the Office of Health and Security, said it was not a national security issue. That I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. That I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. And will I think that the argument that they would always make was, well, we didn't eliminate this capability. We just moved the boxes around. But we know that moving boxes around can have consequence. And, and we've seen that repeatedly, which is why administrations that dismantle these kinds of things often come back and put them back together later. This is a systemic problem. It's bipartisan. It goes administration to administration. As President George W. Bush's first health secretary, Tommy Thompson came in with ambitious plans to shake up the system. The day of 9-11, I had requested and invited in scientists from all over the world to come in and study about uh, coming up with a ubiquitous uh, vaccine for flu. Then, in an instant, everything changed. It does not appear that there's any kind of a, an effort up there yet. Now remember, oh my God. Oh my God. That looks like a second plane. Found out from uh, until 9-11 that uh, there was very little uh, acceptance in Congress of putting money into public health. Attacks on two American cities, New York, and the Capitol in Washington. But as soon as 9-11 happened, Congress could not uh, throw money at it fast enough. And uh, I don't believe that in the previous administration there was enough investments in the public health system. And I'm not being critical, I'm just stating a fact. If 9-11 set the gears in motion for Congress to act, it was another attack that made health security a priority in Washington. Senate office buildings on Capitol Hill and postal facilities along the East Coast would all become contaminated with anthrax spores. After 9-11, we were attacked a second time. Someone or some group, we didn't know at the time, with anthrax, and it was mailed around in letters all through the fall of 2001. President Bush is calling those people who are mailing these anthrax letters evildoers, and he says any attempt to terrorize this nation is gonna fail. And so when anthrax happens, the first question really is, is this an Al-Qaeda attack? We never got the answer to that. We still don't know to this day. But it did spark the fact that it could have been Al-Qaeda and that we were vulnerable to this type of an attack, I think really focused people. Bioterrorism is a real threat to, to our country. Kenneth Bernard had lost his position on the National Security Council when Bush took office. Now he got a call from Homeland Security Advisor Tom Ridge. They wanted him back. 
I walked into his office and he took one look at me and he said, you're the person we need and uh, hired me on the spot. It was interesting. Um, he said, I want you to hire anybody you need to do the job. I'm sorry, I'm, I don't know why I'm getting emotional about this. I was proud that we had leadership in this country that knew what to do when there was a crisis. And I was proud to be able to take part in that and to try to contribute the best I could. The Centers for Disease Control today issued a health warning for Americans following a worldwide outbreak of a mysterious form of pneumonia causing deaths and sending scores to the hospital. In 2002, a case of atypical pneumonia was reported in China. Later known as SARS and caused by a new coronavirus, it spread to 29 countries and killed close to 800 people. Nearly two decades before COVID-19, SARS was a warning that naturally emerging health threats could be just as dangerous as man-made ones. And at the time, it was the first of the really serious coronavirus outbreaks. The world had a preview of the disruption an influenza pandemic can cause. The coronavirus that causes SARS had a very high case fatality rate. It didn't spread as easily through some pretty aggressive actions by China and Hong Kong and other places where it occurred. Uh, it was tamped down and disappeared. All this was caused by a limited outbreak of a virus that infected thousands and lasted about six months. A global influ influenza pandemic that infects millions and lasts from one to three years could be far worse. It emphasized to us at the White House that we had to start dealing with uh, the potential of serious emerging diseases that weren't necessarily intentionally started by a foreign government. We didn't get attacked by them, but nature just evolved them. In response, Tommy Thompson expanded the national stockpile from eight sites to 12. But when he left office in 2005, he was blunt with his colleagues. There are two things that really worry me yet. And the big one is pandemic flu. This is a, a really huge bomb out there that could adversely impact on the health care of the world. And I said, this is what you have to do. We have to get respirators. We have to get ventilators. Does that sound familiar? We have to get beds for our hospitals for surge capacity. We have to get uh, antivirals. We got to have to get a lot of the therapeutic drugs. And uh, I had a whole list of things that needed to go in the strategic stockpiles. I will miss this place. But there is still much to do to better the well-being of Americans. Soon after Thompson departed, the government faced a new threat. This is the front line in the battle against avian flu. Coming out of Southeast Asia, there were concerns that we were uh, sitting on the cusp of an uh, unprecedented infectious disease event. Given how deadly it was, uh, and it was at this point still in avian influenza, that it was circulating among poultry, uh, chickens, ducks, geese, but periodically spilled over into humans. And when it did, it had a mortality rate of about 70%. It's called the H5N1 virus, a primitive piece of genetic material so small it can barely be seen under the most powerful microscopes. A fast mutating avian flu, H5N1 spread quietly through Asia starting in 2003. In 2005, it jumped to migratory birds who carried it to Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. The truth is pandemics happen. They have happened through history. There is no reason to believe that the 21st century will be any different. Now, all of you are, uh, understand why it is that we're concerned today. This H5N1 virus is sweeping across the world. I had been secretary for maybe four months, and I had a, on my schedule an emergency briefing from the Centers for Disease Control. And they came to explain to me that there was a, va a virus, the H5N1, avian influenza that they believed could have pandemic potential. The next morning, a young colleague of mine, a man named Stuart Simonson, came into my office very early. He had two books. The first book was The Great Influenza, A History of the 1918 Pandemic by John Barry. He set it on my desk and said, you need to understand this. And then he set a second book on my desk which was a congressional investigation into the 1976 swine flu and the 
vaccine that ultimately was produced and put into the arms of millions of Americans and actually created lots of sickness. And he pointed to that one and said, if you don't get that one right, there's going to be one of those and it's going to be about you. And that got my attention. Pandemics are a fact of life. They're part of, of, of the microbial world that we live with. You can look through the entire history of humankind and see pandemics, not just that they occur, but when they occur, they reshape the world. For Mike Levitt, the books were an awakening, and he passed one of them along to the president. I have thought through um, the scenarios of what an avian flu outbreak could mean. I tried to get a better handle on what the decision-making process would be by reading Mr. Barry's book on the influenza outbreak in 1918. I would recommend it. He's out at his ranch at Crawford, and he reads this John Barry book, and he comes back. This is 2005, the summer of 2005. And he calls me into the Oval Office and hands me a copy and says, you must read this book. We have to do something about this. Now, you can imagine it's post 9-11. Counterterrorism is an everyday, all day job. We are disrupting threats. And then the last thing I think I've got time to deal with is flu. And I say to him, how, how much of a priority should this be? And it was interesting, the president understood at that time, look, this is the 100 year problem. It may not, likely won't happen on our watch. But that doesn't mean we don't have a responsibility to have a national strategy, that the next team or the team after that can pick up off the shelf. They'll make it their own, they'll make changes, but we owe it to the country to have them be prepared. Our country has been given fair warning of this danger to our homeland and time to prepare. And so we brought together a cross-sectional uh, group of people from agriculture, uh, environment, uh, education, health, to plot out a way forward. How could we uh, begin to bring a virus under control that was circulating in animals and really minimize the risk or the impact on the people? From the beginning, we recognized that we needed to take a comprehensive view of the threat and do everything possible to protect against the emergence and spread of a pandemic virus. We knew that you'd have to have testing, wide-scale testing capability, and contact tracing. In a pandemic, everything from syringes to hospital beds, respirators, masks, and protective equipment would be in short supply. We understood that it was likely in a pandemic the size of the 1918, for example, that the hospitals were going to be overwhelmed. And we will lose more Americans in a pandemic if we're unprepared than we lose in a war. So to meet all our goals, I'm requesting a total of $7.1 billion in emergency funding from the United States Congress. And so that analogy was important in terms of explaining to Congress, you know, it came with a big bill. New Orleans thought it had been spared the worst. And then two major levees broke and slowly the city filled today with water. In New Orleans, Hurricane Katrina had shown the terrible cost of government inaction and the need to prepare for unlikely but devastating events. Katrina did teach Congress and the public that it's not a waste of money or time to prepare for the 100-year event, because that it may happen now. We may be due. The devastation wrought by the hurricanes in the last few months has shown us we can't stop forces of nature, but as the wealthiest country on Earth, we can prepare and we can respond in a way that saves as many of lives as possible. Uh, that's what we have to do with the avian flu. Uh, we're encouraged that the administration has finally released its preparedness plan, and we look forward to working with them on implementing the strongest version possible as soon as possible. Uh, with that, in 2006, Congress passed the Pandemic and All Hazards Preparedness Act. It required states and hospitals to start planning for a pandemic flu and created a new office to fast track the manufacturing of vaccines in the U.S. Every administration is different and laws are taken more seriously or less seriously, uh, but it provided a foundation for the government to begin to think about this in a more sort of systematic way or a more holistic way. For all they had accomplished, officials still wondered if they had done enough and worried that the country would get complacent. And I spent the next three years trying to enliven America's consciousness of the fact that we would have a pandemic someday. 
What we do know is that pandemics happen and that we will have a pandemic at some point in the future if history is our guide. It may not be the H5N1 virus, but we will have one. With so many warnings and so much knowledge of the threat we face, there's no excuse for failure this time around.